Welcome back 2021ers. This will be our final lecture in our series on performance optimizations. In particular, we're focusing on these micro optimizations. If you're reading, reading along at home, you'll want to be finishing up Brian O'Halloran chapter five on optimization. And our goals are to complete a discussion of those micro optimizations today, along with mentioning a couple tools uh, that are interesting and associated with program optimizations. Yesterday's lab should have covered at least a brief introduction to macros and functions and how macros can emulate at least the appearance of functions, uh, but in fact are quite different from them. We'll touch on them and their place in optimizations uh, very soon. These will have some application, all of these optimizations, in Project 4. And again, the idea there is to be optimizing a matrix uh, operation of some kind and also creating a benchmark that will analyze the performance of certain functions and report on those. Brief updates to our schedule. Uh, you'll have uh, this coming Monday a sort of interesting forward-looking lecture on virtual memory. That'll be the first topic that we address post-exam. Uh, but the uh, project itself isn't due for some time, so you have all next week uh, into the following Monday when it is due. Be making steady progress on it if you can, and have particularly a look at uh, homework 11, which outlines a series of functions that do a matrix optimization uh, or sort of a matrix operation and demonstrates the effects of different single optimizations and whether or not they are indeed uh, capable of speeding up performance as predicted or not. Keep in mind that you'll want to use several of the, well, the techniques that are demonstrated in that homework in Project 4 in order to make your diagonal summing code fly. We left off last time uh, discussing the following, uh, which is this topic of loop unrolling. Uh, we've sort of covered some reasons why this technique of copying and pasting some additional code and rearranging variables in loop bodies can lead to better performance, and then demonstrated a couple facets of that. Uh, first and foremost, that the compiler can oftentimes do it for you. And second, loop unrolling doesn't always improve performance. It probably will in the case of the project, so keep it in mind there. But out there in the wild, when you're doing actual software development, you likely would want to keep your source code fairly pristine and instead get the compiler to do these kinds of optimizations for you uh, if you suspect that they would actually improve performance. And for that, you'd want to research not the code techniques, but the proper compiler options to pass. The next thing that we should address quickly, which came up in our discussion of why loop unrolling actually improves performance, is whether conditionals at large affect the performance of your programs at all. To that end, I have again two versions of code on the left-hand side. There's one that involves a condition, and in this case it's a loop that is summing things up, in this case summing even numbers up, uh, and the even numbers are detected by using a little bitwise trick here. Typically, one would use a modulus 2 and detect whether or not the result of that is equal to 0. We learned that at the low level, finding uh, quotients and remainders using division instructions can be quite expensive. And if you're just looking for evenness and oddness, one trick you can use is, of course, uh, to look at the lowest order bit. Uh, if that lowest order bits by masking with a bitwise and this number i uh, on with a 0, 1 here, if that is set, then it's an odd number. Uh, and if it's unset, as in the results of this anding is a 0, uh, then you have an even number on your hands. This is not a particularly good loop to add up even numbers because obviously the right thing to do would be to generate a sequence of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Uh, this would eliminate the unneeded work of visiting uh, odd elements. And smarter cookies than that would even recall that there is probably a closed form solution of such uh, an even sequence uh, by doing some arithmetic and some sequence analysis to find an identity that this is really two times one plus two plus three plus four plus five, etc. And there's a closed form solution for that, certainly. But this is designed not to compute that number efficiently, but to demonstrate the effects of this conditional. Compared to the next block of code, which we'll address in just a second, what you see if you do this sort of debug level optimizations, the minimal kinds of things that the compiler can do to rearrange code, uh, you get essentially a 4x speed up by 
computing this sequence using some odd operations that we'll expound on in just a second. Uh, cranking up the optimizations narrows the gap just a little bit, but you still are getting twice the speed out of this conditionless code down here. Now, why you would go from here to here is clearly a sort of speed benefit is at stake, but what's lost is the ability to easily understand what's going on in that code, as the tricks that are used here are somewhat subtle and rely upon a good understanding at the bit level of how operations work. Most of you will be in that position at this point, but I'm not here to encourage you to write code that looks like this, uh, instead to examine the trade-offs between these two. So to, in, to compute this sort of odd sequence business without invoking any conditionals up here, the first check is similar in that I will establish a variable called odd here that's anded on, uh, I anded on to this mask of one. Uh, but rather than check using an if there, I'm gonna subtract one off this. The result of subtracting one is gonna be either the value zero or the value minus one. The value zero is gonna occur if I have i as an odd number. Uh, the anding here is gonna produce a one because odd numbers have a bit that's set in their lowest order bit that's rightmost. And so the value for odd here is gonna be one in the even or in the odd case. Uh, and so if I subtract one off, this even mask is going to become zero. Alternatively, if this is an even number, i is, then it'll have a zero in the oldest order place and the result of anding here is going to be a zero. And so as odd is zero and I subtract one from it, I underflow arithmetic and end up with a mask of all ones here. This is a nice little trick that exploits the fact that the representation for minus one using signed two's complement is a sequence of all ones, OXFFFFF in this case. And by then anding on this mask, which is either zero or all ones, I'll either eliminate everything in I and add on zero to my son, or and on a whole bunch of ones, which preserves I, uh, leading to adding on only even digits here. Clearly, this kind of code is not easy on the eyes, and if you were asked to maintain or upgrade this, it would be no small task. With some work and proper documentation, which would always be welcome in a case where you're using snaky bits of code like this, you could probably work through it. But it should not be lost upon you that this is harder to read and maintain than this earlier one. And so there's a trade-off between the speed that you gain by using the later version and the ability to morph code like this. Very rarely is it the case that code sort of lives on its own, that it's a live entity that over time is gonna to need to change and adapt and alter in various ways. I think one of the ultimate examples of this is a piece of computer science lore that is worth knowing about, even if you don't understand it entirely. And the Google search term for this is fast inverse square root. Uh, there's a nice Wikipedia article on this. Uh, the operation that's to be computed here uh, looks like this, one divided by the square root of some variable uh, x. And this comes up in contexts I'm not entirely familiar with, uh, but are present when you do ray tracing for graphics. Ray tracing is when you need to compute the path of a ray of light and how it reflects off various bodies in a 3D setting. Uh, and apparently this computation is needed frequently in that. Early graphics involved doing this in the CPU itself because well, graphics cards uh, didn't exist or they were primitive at that point. And even the processor itself had a fairly slow and uh, un, uh, sort of unreliable floating point unit. Uh, and to that end, the slowness here required some real ingenuity to compute this one divided by square root of x uh, efficiently uh, to make the graphics in early 90s games at least uh, shine reasonably well. Uh, with the advent of more advanced graphic cards and better processors, a lot of this was um, sort of negated, but it's worth considering as a historical example in which uh, the fine art of optimization sort of uh, got away from folks to the point that no, understood, no one understood how it worked anymore. So the code to do this is uh, down here, and I think you can sort of try to trace through what's going on here, but the things that I point out is that nowhere in here do you see the square root uh, called, nowhere in here do you see any division used, because division, again, is a slow instruction. And everywhere in here do you see all kinds of crazy bit-level operations 
including this mysterious constant uh, that has, I think, an apropos uh, comment uh, associated with it. Uh, rest assured that while this might not compute the inverse square roots, uh, reciprocal square roots exactly, it gets a very close approximation and does so in very few cycles. Now, if you were asked to improve the speed of this thing or otherwise demonstrate your understanding of it, I think most of us would be completely lost, including myself. But some entrepreneuring, like graphics programmer, early on recognized that this figure, figured out that this trick actually works and played it in games. Uh, who exactly came up with this uh, was probably, that's lost to the annals of history. Uh, but for the moment, at least, it's worthwhile to consider as the ultimate sort of extreme of this is more performance, but nigh impossible to understand. So be aware of that out in the field, that you'll probably see trade-offs in that part, and consider always the future viability of the code that you're writing against the present gains in speed you might be getting uh, by writing such crazy code. All right, a few other things on this front. It bears some attention to discuss the place of macros in this. Now, on the left-hand side, we have uh, something that looks very much like the right-hand side. Uh, and we have been using in some of our examples these mget and vset type macros that uh, are designed to give you access to this matrix and vector data structure uh, that is essentially a glorified one-dimensional array uh, but uses some nice accessor and setter methods, uh, functions, uh, to uh, sort of work with them. It should have crossed your mind at this point um, as to why we're using these macro machinations rather than just using plain old-fashioned functions for this. So on the left-hand side and the right-hand side here are two equivalent bits of code, and it's worth considering which is faster. It probably is not worth your time at this point to pause and deliberate on this because clearly there must be some reason we're using macros uh, rather than functions, and it is speed. Why it is more speedy is another matter. And so it's time to spend just a couple minutes to understand why this macro business actually goes faster. Uh, to that end, there are a bunch of sort of ways we can understand this, but I think the first and most important is to actually look at what the preprocessor does to these macros. The preprocessor is an early stage in the compilation chain. Uh, before you ever get a data structure associated with your code and long before you start optimizing that data structure and applying transformations that ultimately generate better assembly code in the back end. Before any of that, the preprocessor has its place to take certain elements of the source code that you have and substitute other source code in its place. And this is generally the meaning of macros in the large is do something small that becomes something large. We'll talk about some other instances of macros in a second, but we can demonstrate the C preprocessor and its macro expansion facilities uh, just by invoking the compiler in the proper way uh, with this GCC and dash E uh, uh, option, which terminates compilation at this preprocessor stage, which is fairly early on before a lot of the other compiler does its business. So we'll pull up the code that's uh, present in today's code pack, uh, this uh, op um, optimization code pack. Uh, in here, you have this funcvmacro.c uh, code. And in it is some of the code that appears in that slide, including this mget vset business. And the two macros, mget and vset macros, you can see they're fairly ugly on the eyes uh, because uh, there's some danger when you write macros uh, that as a textual substitution, things will go slightly wonky. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but then there's the row sums A version, which uses the standard functions, and row sums B version down here that uses the macros. So if I jump over to a terminal here, I'm just gonna carrot this so that it's a little bit shorter on the eyes. Oh, folks often ask, uh, what is this carrot business? Uh, it's just setting a certain shell variable, PS1, uh, to be whatever you want your prompt to be. Uh, and it's, so it's a shorthand for me to change my prompt to something short so I have more horizontal real estate. Uh, so there's nothing special there. I'll run carrot again to get me the shortest possible prompt. Uh, to that end, uh, GCC this with the dash E option, uh, func v macro. Uh, the normal behavior of this option is to take the output it would normally produce and print it on the screen. Uh, so it gets uh, quite verbose. Uh, 
I don't, I want to be able to look at this in a text editor so that I get syntax highlighting. So I'm just going to pump the uh, output that would normally go to the screen into the file x.c. Uh, so this will complete relatively fast, uh, leaving an x.c file on the file system, uh, which I'll open up uh, to examine uh, presently. Uh, if you had engaged in the lab exercise associated with the preprocessor, this shouldn't be too surprising to you. You'll have seen some things that are like this. Uh, but importantly, what we're looking at up towards the top of this uh, comes from all of the pound includes that I did early on. There's some directives up here indicating that the file that I was compiling was uh, func v macro, along with a bunch of other information that the compiler in its midst will potentially use. Uh, but as we move ahead, you'll see lots of references to uh, pounds includes uh, that we made. Uh, for instance, up top here, uh, we had pound included the standard library that gives us malloc and so forth, standard IO for printf, the string library, uh, one of my, the own header files that has uh, the matrix and vector data structures in them, uh, system time and so forth. So a lot of this stuff actually comes from the system files. Uh, and if you look carefully in here, you'll see functions declared like a to i and a to f that converts a string into an integer or a string into a floating point. Uh, you'll see somewhere in here uh, the standard sorts of uh, printf, uh, yeah, like f printf and printf functions declared but not defined. This is the meaning of these header files up here, which is to insert their contents in here so that the later parts of the program know what the calling convention for printf and fprintf uh, and vprintf and a to i and so forth is. And the compiler can generate the right sequence of instructions as it uh, in compiles the call to printf to put arguments in the right registers and so forth. So a lot of this stuff is sort of innocuous. Uh, you can see in terms of line numbers down here, and I can bring those up on the editor as well, uh, that there's quite a lot of stuff brought in here. We're already at line 1500, and this is still stuff that's coming from the headers. Generally, this is why there's no need for you to invoke the preprocessor to look at any of this stuff. It gets fed directly into the compiler internals, and a lot of it is just there to establish names for symbols that might be needed uh, that are coming from the standard libraries. I'm going to zoom all the way down to the bottom of the file, which is 2,500 some lines in. Uh, you can see a few spots in here where line numbers have been marked for various reasons. Uh, but where I want to turn our attention to is those two functions. Um, the row sums A and the row sums B, and compare them to their equivalents over on the left-hand side here. Uh, let me get them lined up so that they're both more or less at the top of the screen. Uh, and I don't think it's probably worth it to see the line numbers anymore, so I'll turn those off. So the left-hand side is the original source, right-hand side is the source code that's gone through the preprocessor. First off, you can see that the row sums function, despite the preprocessor working on it, hasn't done anything. So it's exactly the same as it was previously. And so this form is going to go into the compiler, and you'll see calls to mgets and vset and so forth generated on that. The macros themselves, in terms of their definition, have completely disappeared. And that's because this is essentially an instruction to the compiler to perform later code transformations. It's done so directly beneath where you'll see where the macros were used, mget and vset, the code has been transformed. And this is the source code that actually gets fed then into the internals for the compiler. You can see there isn't any sort of a call anymore. So this, despite this thing looking like a function call, it's actually a pattern substitution to say, uh, in the definition for the macro, macro, wherever you see the symbol mat here, uh, then plop this thing down. Wherever you see the uh, symbol uh, i uh, come up in here, uh, plop down this symbol i. And wherever you uh, see the symbol j, plop this symbol down, j down. Uh, there was no need for me to use the same names here. It's a coincidence, and we can mess around with that in just a second. Uh, but suffice to say that the transformation over here took this pattern and laid it down over here. And took this pattern for vsets and laid it down over here. Uh, so that instead of something that's a function call, I have straight line code here. That's important for a couple reasons. Um, first, it is the case that normal function calls and you'll understand from our assembly level discussion of this, change the flow of control. That whereas you were executing a stream of instructions associated with the assembly in row sums, after you call mget as a function, you're going to jump to a different place in the code entirely. 
Importantly, in order to get that control transfer to happen, several things need to take place. Arguments need to be stuffed into the correct registers, and something needs to be pushed into the stack that could be arguments, but it is always the return address of how do I get back to this function. And there, those parts of it really disrupt the compiler's ability to, uh, uh, to optimize things effectively here. Uh, it has to jump control elsewhere, use certain registers, which you couldn't use for other things like arithmetics, uh, to pass arguments, uh, and actually make main memory manipulations, as pushing into the stack means plopping something down in main memory. Uh, on the return, then, a whole series of registers are uh, invalidated. Everything that are the caller save registers uh, is uh, potentially, it has been changed by this mget function. And so you're essentially crippling the compiler by saying, when I call this, any registers that you thought you had in hand may have changed. So you really only have a fraction, uh, like six of the registers uh, that are general purpose to use in this context. Uh, they may change across this function call bar barrier. Uh, and that same thing happens once again down here. So all that to say then uh, that the stream of instructions and the pipeline is disrupted by the function call. The register use is, uh, is sort of... Uh, much harder for the compiler to optimize in this case, uh, and their main memory operations, which we've seen, are not particularly good uh, for performance. Changing that to the macro version means everything is straight line. Where I was jumping control elsewhere, I now just have some arithmetics to compute. Where I was having to use registers up here to pass arguments, I have no such obligation down here. And there are, is the strong potential then that the compiler could fit all this stuff in registers and avoid the need to touch main memory at all. Now macros have a sort of interesting flavor in that respect in that you can aff affect sort of code transformations that result in better efficiency, where you want something short that looks kind of like a function call, uh, has you know, reasonably complex semantics, uh, but don't want the function control overhead associated with it, uh, then you can sometimes replace that with a macro. I mentioned earlier that the names of symbols up here are not uh, particularly important. Uh, so I could, for instance, rename this matrix uh, and this A and this B, or actually maybe row and column are more appropriate. As long as I make the uh, changes over here uh, to matrix and calls, and this will be call, like C uh, for, yeah, sorry, it'll be row, uh, which is uh, R and C, uh, then it'll be good to go. Uh, if I rerun the... Uh, uh, compiler to regenerate the macros uh, into x.c. Let's see. Oh, and I, yeah, <laughs> I've uh, screwed up something here now. Uh, let's see. M gets is, uh, let's see. A M get, where M get redefine included from macro v funk here. Uh, let's see. 35 and 25. Hmm. Not sure what's happening in this case. Uh, don't matter too much. Uh, let me come back to the x.c file. Uh, and we're just going to hope that this uh, didn't uh, uh, burn us too badly. Uh, okay, so the point of this was just to demonstrate that... Uh, oh, shoot. Okay, I have a header here uh, that is uh, messing things up. Uh, so let me go into that uh, matvec... Uh, dot h and I changed the definition of the macro so I need to comment this one out okay so it was reading from the header this macro definition and then I changed the definition of it in the c file itself uh, and that's something the compiler is checking so I will I will run this and we'll be back to into business then okay so find x dot c uh, there it is okay cool uh, and then if I find that uh, b version then yeah I have uh, successfully plopped the, the same stuff down here. So you see the same changes despite this, uh, the names up here changing. These are more what to substitute in terms of that pattern. And in terms of their application, the mat substitutes for matrix, the I for R, uh, and the J for C up here according to that pattern. So um, a couple of things then on that front. Uh, macros have a lot of limitations to them. And they tend to be difficult to write effectively because essentially anything you write here uh, can end up in your source code someplace. And that includes lots of sort of weird syntactic business. The other sort of crippling part of macros is you have to write them on a single line. There's some ways around this by escaping the end of a line to be able to continue it. 
Uh, but generally, this is a fraught effort and sometimes sort of difficult to happen. Uh, so be careful and don't, at a first gas, uh, attempt to convert everything in your code into macros. They lack a lot of other nice properties that functions have uh, that, uh, for instance, have identities in debuggers. Uh, there's no use of recursion in macros uh, and various other things like that that still leave a lot of room for functions to fulfill most needs. And the final part of this is then that uh, it's worth knowing that the compiler can oftentimes perform this kind of a transformation for you. Uh, the next sort of discussion of this centers around an optimization known as function inlining. Uh, and the point here is that the transformation we've just done, which is to create macro versions here of some relatively short one-line functions, is simple enough uh, that the compiler with the right options will do it on your behalf. Now there are some benefits and drawbacks to this. Certainly if you, in the place of the function calls up here in the A version, substitute in the bodies of these functions, you get essentially the same macro effect that this code substitutes in and becomes a straight line without the need to call function instead. Um, the trouble with doing this broadly is why don't I inline all such functions is that it uh, can create some more code bloat as in where you would have repeated function calls, which is, limits the amount of code in one function. If you substitute in the body for those other functions, then you increase the size of code in the position that you're uh, substituting. And this can put more uh, instruction cache pressure on the processor as it's running. Generally then, function inlining should be restricted uh, to small-ish functions uh, that are going to do sort of a, a normal-ish purpose. You can see that uh, over here, if I compile and run the original A and B versions that are mentioned here, uh, the A version takes uh, a tenth of a second or so versus the B version that featured macros and get down to four hundredths of a, a second. Uh, by turning on the inlining of small functions here, uh, then I get much closer to this uh, um, uh, function version, uh, inlining them gets close to the macro, uh, only off by a factor of I don't know, one and a half to two uh, here. And if I further turn on the most aggressive kinds of optimizations that the compiler can do, I get nearly identical performance between these two. As a part of that aggressive level of optimization, it's very likely that the compiler is doing something close to the inlining that's present there. So again, uh, you can force the hand of the compiler by stating things as macros, or you can ask it to make those choices for you uh, by up, upping the level of uh, aggressiveness of the optimizations that it's going to try. And then it will do those things when it makes sense. Uh, generally then, uh, what you'd sort of look for is opportunities that you know the compiler might miss, uh, which are hard to spot in a lot of cases, uh, at which point you'd make use of macros yourself. It bears mentioning a couple of things uh, that are tangential to this. A lot of languages that are more modern than C, uh, Java being notorious among these, have tons of functions that look like these, what are essentially glorified sets and gets of the fields of some class. It's very typical for the Java compiler to initially generate some function call for this, uh, but after some uh, number of times that it's called or some number of times that another function is called, uh, then the compiler or the runtime engine that Java is, uh, has built into it will on the fly optimize some of those function calls and very frequently inline the sort of one line getter and setter kinds of functions to increase the speed uh, of long running Java programs. Essentially, most of the speed that you can get out of Java is obtained through those online optimizations that the runtime engine does on its own. It's the hotspot compiler uh, and hot, uh, sort of hotspot uh, runtime engine that's built into the modern Javas. It's sort of a marvel of compiler engineering that it's able to do this on the fly. Uh, also, it should be mentioned that the kinds of macros that you're seeing here in C they show up elsewhere, uh, and it's worth saying that Lisp takes this to the next level. The kinds of macros you have here are sort of, you know, substitutions, more or less. 
And in Lisp, you'll also see macros used as uh, substitutions. The big change there is that the syntax associated with Lisp is much simpler than it is for pretty much every other programming language. Everything shows up as a list, and macros are often used to do transformations uh, to code to try to improve efficiency or to open up new syntactic constructs that make programming more convenient. Uh, Lisp is well known for this feature for those who use it and sort of misunderstood uh, by those who don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, to that end, it's worth investigating uh, how Lisp works and how it can really make use of macros uh, to provide ease of use and optimizations that are just not possible in most other programming settings. All right, so we'll leave off on this uh, optimization part associated with function inlining and macros at the moment, but hopefully that gives you a sense of the place of functions and how they can be an impediment to optimization. And some of that can be circumvented using compiler options that affect the same uh, end goal that macros do, which is to substitute code into a place uh, that it's being used uh, so that you don't have any control flow uh, changes there. The last part of this optimization discussion is to give you some tools that will assist you in figuring out where exactly to devote your optimization efforts. Profilers or code pro profilers are a typical sort of class of tools uh, that are meant to, while code runs, make measurements about what it's doing and where it's spending its time in order to guide you later on by reporting most of the time that the program spent was in this function or that function. Certainly, we've seen you can hand instrument this by using the little clock function uh, and starting and stopping clocks. What profilers add to the mix is automation on that front. The typical profiler will, if you compile your code right, automatically generate a report about what percent of the time was spent in all of the various functions that comprise your application. The standard profile that exists in most Unix systems is called gprof, and GCC has built-in support for it. Typically, to profile your code, you have to instrument it in a certain way, and this simply means passing the right options to GCC while your code is compiled. In this case, it's the dash P and G. The dash G we've seen adds debugging information. The dash P part uh, actually instruments the code for profiling so that the debugging tool or the uh, profiling tool gprof can read the report uh, that the uh, code will output. The typical flow then uh, is that as you would compile your code, you pass appropriate options in there. Past versions of GCC had various kinds of little bugs in it that um, had some issues that I don't think you'll find are at stake anymore, but his for uh, historical completeness, uh, this mentions a few things in earlier versions of GCC uh, that are sort of worth knowing about so that if you're using those older versions, you can pass the appropriate options. Uh, but generally then, if you pass the right options, uh, you will get a compiled version of your code. In this case, we're compiling this unroll.c code uh, to the executable unroll. Uh, if you ls at this point, then you'll see in the directory, you have the executable, you have the original source. If you run the code then, uh, in this case, I have to have pass parameter on how like many uh, iterations to do some computation. I believe this is coming from one of our earlier exercises. Then you'll see the standard output uh, for your program, but behind the scenes, the program will have output a little report in the form of this gmon.out file. So if I ls again, uh, this gmon.out is now present in addition to the executable in the unroll.c. Uh, if I ask what type of file is this thing, uh, then it will tell me it's a gprof performance data. And then if I invoke gprof in the right way, uh, using uh, some options and this unroll, uh, which is the program that was run, it will automatically pick up the default file gmon.out and produce a report that looks something like the following. Uh, at the top will be a sampling percentage of how much time was spent in each of the functions. Uh, in this case, uh, according to the statistical sampling that gprof did, half of the time was spent in some range B, about a quarter of the time in some range A, and about a quarter of the time in some range C. This is further broken down, if you can interpret it, uh, to a call graph where uh, it's related how much time was spent in each sort of function call sequence. 
and 100% of the time here was I ran main, which then ran these two uh, and gave uh, some percentage over there. Uh, the most expensive sort of call tree was uh, main to some range B. Now this must may not make a lot of sense because you're probably thinking this benchmark just had main and it called this one and then main called this one and then it's called this one. We'll look at a more complex example in just a second. Uh, but uh, clearly then these short call graphs, they're reflecting uh, the call tree that's uh, over here. So in order to give you a better sense of where this might actually be applicable, there is a program included in your code pack that comes from our textbook, uh, Bryant and Halron. Uh, it is a little dictionary program. Now I can't remember exactly what this does. Uh, I think it counts how many occurrences of words are, are in there or um, something like that. It, it may take me just a minute in order to uh, figure out exactly how to invoke this thing. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's a fairly complex application. And if you just scan down to the bottom, we've got 700 lines of code. Uh, and if you scan through it, you'll see there are a whole litany of different functions that are used in here, including Brian O'Halloran's uh, very own version of Sterling in here. God knows why they decided to write their own version, uh, but uh, I'm not going to question them at this point. Perhaps it makes it easier to come up in the profile report on, on that function. So generally, uh, this program has a couple of different ways that it can be invoked. I'm going to quickly cheat and look in the make file associated with this and just see that, okay, uh, first I want to get rid of this thing, and then I want to feed it a data file uh, that is coming out of something here as standard in. Uh, I'm using uh, some random text file that has a lot of text in it, uh, this craft67.txt, uh, which if I remember right, I downloaded from uh, someplace. It's a bunch of abstracts for medical papers. Uh, for, so you'll see abstract here, and then later on another abstract, which is another medical paper. Uh, all kinds of wonky words in here that have to do with DNA sequences and drugs that are being used and so forth. But this is text that is going to be analyzed uh, in some sort of a dictionary fashion. Uh, if I run this then remove that dash f at uh, gmon.out uh, and then do this dictionary business uh, just on its own, uh, then I can start typing things like hello and goodbye and so long and no more and hello maybe again. And now I'm just going to uh, indicate to the program there's no more input. Uh, and it gives me some sort of output along with the total compute time uh, spent. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the output is like, but it's something like maybe the most frequent word, uh, hello appeared twice in this case. Um, this isn't very fun because I have to type everything in, so it makes sense then to feed the data file in for this. Uh, so here I will scroll back up in history and then plop in this craft uh, uh, 67.txt as the input file. Uh, this will take a second uh, for the uh, program to run uh, and then it'll spit some uh, information out over here. Uh, so importantly, you'll see over here there are two options to run this program in, uh, but I want to focus uh, first on what just happened behind the scenes because uh, in addition to producing output over here, it's also the case that this code was profiled and how has this profiler uh, outputs that I can examine. So if I run gprof at this point, as the makefile sort of indicates, uh, then I'll see a long litany of output up here. Uh, and perhaps most importantly up top, I see two interesting features that 35 or 36 or so percent of my time was spent in this uh, find elements uh, function and 36 percent was spent in this sort words function. After that, the Sterling function was uh, the next most expensive. And so if you're looking to expend some effort to determine where should you uh, optimize this program to get the most benefits, you have very clear uh, targets right at the top of this that these two functions for sort words and this find LL uh, rec, whatever that function is, they would be worth, worth looking up in the source code and determining what they do. You can sort of infer that this has something to do with sorting and this has something to do with finding. And so it's probably a good idea at this point uh, to go have a look at those. Further down, uh, you'll see that uh, there are call tree graphs in here that indicate uh, 
what percentage of time was spent in various uh, call trees. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how to interpret this. Uh, there's uh, sort of some business about how many frequently various things were called. Uh, certainly these functions that are called a lot are potentially good targets for it, uh, so long as you're spending a fair amount of time there. Uh, but it's definitely the case that there's a wealth of information here that can be used to guide uh, where you devote optimization efforts. Uh, importantly then, uh, I just want to demonstrate that this sort uh, words function uh, that's mentioned up here is the source of quite a bit of the computation that's associated with uh, this thing. It's called once and I spend some 230 units of time in there, about a third of my time. Uh, this is on account of the function that's built in there. If you looked at it, you'd find it's one of those insertion or bubble sort algorithms that's n squared. Uh, with the tweak of an option here, I can instead make use of quick sort, which is a much more efficient sorting algorithm. Let me just quickly uh, remove that gmon.out because uh, each time you run the program, uh, this little uh, report actually updates. So you can run several times and then get aggregate results. Right now, I just want to compare this last run that I had, uh, which used the inefficient sorting algorithm, uh, to this version where... I will pass in the quick sort algorithm uh, and turn it on so that instead of uh, spending time in that uh, cheap sorting or that, that crappy sorting uh, insertion sort, I'll make use of quick sort. Uh, I should get my results back somewhat faster. You saw 1.3 seconds earlier, now we're down to 1.09 seconds. And if I recall that uh, gprof, let's see, need to. Uh, find the right uh, G prop. There it is. Okay. Uh, on this thing, uh, then up here, I should see that the amount of time that was spent sorting stuff has dropped to almost nothing. That instead, the vast majority of my time is instead spent in this find LR rec, which would be probably the next target to uh, determine what to optimize. Now, maybe the case that I don't want to actually optimize this function, uh, that instead I have to optimize where it's called or make some larger rearrangements to determine uh, some better data structure used to make the finding faster. The point is then, uh, though, that if I identified the sorting algorithm as something to get rid of and then subsequently replaced it with a better sorting algorithm, uh, then I'm on to being able to optimize what the next best thing is uh, after having dropped my time down by 30% uh, or so. To that end, uh, profilers are an incredibly useful tool to determine where the program's spending its time and therefore where you should spend your time uh, getting rid of stuff. Uh, on that front, that is the last piece of our optimization discussion. Uh, as a brief sort of uh, foray into past runs of this uh, sort words business uh, that closes out the slides, but that's essentially all I have for you uh, on this front. There are many other kinds of optimizations that we could go into, but we've touched at least on some of the easiest to understand and most useful ones to be aware of. And importantly, you found in most cases, uh, the compiler can do some of these things for you. And the things that it can't, uh, they are by far the more important kinds of optimizations to be aware of. These again are selection of data structures and algorithms. So look forward in your future classes and look back on your past classes to make sure that those tools are readily in hand. That's all I have for you for the moment. Uh, this conclusion will be followed up next week by a change into a new subject prior to our exam. None of that will appear on the exam itself. Uh, instead, we will just start that discussion before breaking to take the uh, moment to review for the exam and then move on to do it next Friday. I hope everyone is happy and healthy and happy hacking until we see each other next.